Welcome everyone to a very special edition of Husker Headlines here where we're focusing specifically on Nebraska basketball and the impressive season that is to date heading into Minneapolis for the Big Ten Tournament. Robin Washett here with Steve Sippel and uh, you've noticed the Sean Callahan is not here. He's probably uh, out in a Hawaiian beach throwing back some Mai Tais right now. So. <laughs> yeah, probably. He's with his daughter so, so he's not getting too okay, wild well, and his wife. Either way, he's... Uh, He's probably doing it a little better than we are right but now. But, well, we're doing just <laughs> fine. I mean, you know what we're doing? We're doing March Madness. We are doing March Madness. And we're doing legitimate March Madness. First time in a long time. How about that? How about that? Let's bring in the... So, yeah, speaking of yeah. March Madness, we have with us today a very special guest, the man himself, head coach of the University of Nebraska men's basketball team, Fred Hoiberg. Coach, thank you so much for joining us. I'm sure it's been a uh, pretty hectic week for you guys, all things considered. Yeah, great, great being on your show, guys. Thanks for having me. Well, I guess uh, you know we'll we'll kind of start broad here. Um, you know, I know after the game, listening to your interview with uh, Kent Pavelka, uh, he asked you coming off that Michigan win and you know the close of the regular season, just what the level of sense of accomplishment was for for you and and, and for your team, given all that you've been able to do thus far. Kind of what's the balance between looking back and reflecting on? Uh, you know, all the all the impressive feats that, that have happened to date while also not getting too caught up in it and staying uh, focused on the task at hand where, where things get real now heading into March. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's been a really fun season. And I know I talked a lot about this early in the year that we had a group that was going to be very enjoyable to be around uh, on a daily basis. And that's exactly what's happened. These guys have come to work every day, even after setbacks or after tough games. They still come in and are very resilient and get back to work and really start with preparation, which is so important uh, to bounce back from games like that. And, you know, the way that we ended this season, I believe it was seven to eight at the end of the year and getting two big road wins. We know how important that was. And that was a big narrative on our team is we were really good in Pinnacle Bank Arena at home. Uh, but could we go out and get a couple on the road, you know, to really solidify the opportunity to play? Um, in March in the postseason, and that's exactly what our guys did. And, and it started with that game in Indiana, which uh, was an unbelievable start for us, and then hit a huge patch of adversity and found a way to get it back going again, the things that had made us successful in that first half and getting a big double-digit win on the road, and then following that up with the last game of the year. That was a really important game for us, that Michigan game, to, uh, to go out there and get another big win against a team that's dangerous. They had been very close. And, and, you know, I think the biggest example of that the week before was Purdue, where it was a single digit game all the way up until the last two minutes. And, you know, had a, a tie game with Michigan State with two minutes to go. So we knew that was a completely different team than the one that we faced at PBA a couple weeks prior because of Doug McDaniel being on the floor. So, yeah. you know, to find a way to get it going and Casey obviously got us off to a great start. And, uh, and and we you know had a really good defensive effort in the second half uh, to get that huge win, you know, to give us some momentum heading into Minneapolis. And as I've told the guys, I mean, you know, we don't have a lot of players on this roster that have played in the big tournament. And, you know, I'm very fortunate. I played in three of them. I coached in four of them at Iowa State. And there's nothing like it. You know, all the work that you put in, you know, the body work over the course of the year, even going back to April and June when we were going through our workouts to get ready for our foreign trip to Spain in July. It's all for what we're about to embark on is this postseason journey. And it starts in Minneapolis. And, you know, having the opportunity to stand on a ladder and cut down nets at a conference tournament twice, again, those are things you're going to remember for the rest of your life. And then the opportunity to play um, in, in March Madness uh, is something that these guys will always remember, especially here. I think this is only the eighth time in the history of the program where we're going to have an opportunity uh, to play on this stage and, um, you know, hopefully do something that's never been done in the history of this program. But, you know, when I look back on this entire journey, when we put this group together, I guess to answer your initial question, Robin, it's just been a, a very focused, uh, driven group. And I think you've seen that, you know, we did not defend great in January, but when you look at our February numbers and the little things that we did to tweak our defense, to give us a better chance to be more consistent, uh, and to be one of the top five defensive teams in the country, uh, in the month of February, that's what allowed us to go on a run. We've been a pretty solid, consistent offensive team. Uh, but our defensive turnaround is what is putting us in this position right now. So I've just, it's been a group that, you know, when I look back on my career, when it's all over, uh, who knows when that'll be. But, 
you know, this will always go down as one of the favorite favorite groups that I've ever been around. Fred, I was I was um, sort of irrationally interested in the Michigan game um, because of the because of what you faced. I mean, it was a Sunday morning tip off in a quiet arena, and I really wondered what 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 would the energy be like from your guys. What did you tell them? Did you address that part going in, and how much of it? How how much how much help was it that Casey looked like he was full of energy in that in that early in the early going of that game? Yeah, it, it is something that we talk about, Steve. When you play those early games, the importance of getting off to a good start, and the team that comes out of the gate the fastest generally wins those early games. And not only the you know eleven a.m. Central start, but also you lose an hour with uh you know with the spring forward so really it was a 10 a.m game really for our guys and when uh you know the one advantage i think that we had we practice in the morning and you know we come in generally get started uh at eight o'clock with a film session and then our guys uh you know go through their warm-ups and we'll do some testing with the strength coach in the sports science uh, department and then we'll get on the floor and then they'll lift so you know we've had the advantage of practicing early and we played a lot of games at a lot of different times last week we had an eight o'clock uh game we had an eight thirty game um you know the week before that uh, you know p.m on the road and then you wow. bounce back and play a couple of early games here uh and that's going to help us in the tournament you know when i was at iowa state we won the big 12 conference tournament and it was such an emotional ride and we had played pretty much all evening games seven or eight o'clock tips and then they put us in the first game at 11 a.m on Thursday, which isn't right. If you win your conference tournament, you should at least play a late game Thursday or, you know, even into Friday. Uh, and we got upset. And, you know, the the benefit of this team is we played games at any time and every time. We had three 530 games uh, in our last three home games on Sunday. So, you know, that's going to help us. As little as that might seem, you know, to your point, Steve, when you have an early game and you have to come out and set the tone, it's exactly what our guys did. And I think the fact that we've had early practice times and early games really helped us in that area. You're here listening to a special basketball edition of Husker Headlines, joined here by Nebraska head coach Fred Hoiberg. Coach, you mentioned just the, the tournament teams and March Madness experience you've had as a player and as a coach. What is, is there a way to kind of just explain the difference between the level of intensity and everything that comes with this time of year compared to the regular season, just the kind of win or go home mentality you have to have. And and what about this group maybe gives you optimism they'll be able to handle kind of this this new stage they're going to be on here? Yeah, I mean, it's it's the reason you're in this business. It's the reason you play this game is to have the opportunity to compete for championships. And, you know, you see it every year. There's 8, 9, 10, 11 seeds that are playing in the Final Four for a national championship. So it's it's really why you do this. It's why you're in this business. So, uh, you know, it's the, like I said, it's the fun time of year. It's like in the NBA, I'll never forget Kevin McHale talking about, you know, just the grind of the 82 game regular season. And then, you know, you have that carrot at the end and then you get the opportunity to play in the playoffs and compete for a, a world championship. You know, here it's the same thing. You go through so much with, you know, this, the strength and conditioning sessions in the offseason, the eight hours that you get uh, four in the weight room, four on the court. You know, there's so much work behind the scenes. You know, people see you 31 times during the regular season and in, in your exhibitions. And then, you know, the, all of that is designed to put yourself in a position to what we're about to go through. And, you know, I do like our team right now. We're playing the best basketball that we've played all season. And a lot of that has to do with the defensive identity that we've created. And that's what wins games at this time of year. And that's what has to continue to be our constant. The other thing that we can't do is go away from what has been making us successful. And sometimes when you get on the biggest stage, you get away a little bit and you try to do too much. You know, we're in a good place. You know, I really like the way that our team is competing and playing together right now. And I don't think that's going to be an issue, uh, but that will be stressed. This, you know, when we get back on the floor starting tomorrow after the off day is just continue to go out and be the best version of yourself. And if we do that, uh, we're going to have a chance to do something that has never been done before in this program. Fred, that defense, you know, I mean, it's, I, I think it's sort of defined by doubling the post, but how else would you characterize it? And, and who would you, who do you credit most for that? 
Yeah. I, I, Nate Lenzer is a guy that I really went to. Um, you know, Nate and I have been together for a long time. I brought him in uh, as an, as, uh, really as my video guy at Iowa State. And then once I was able to get him into, you know, a full time coaching position, uh, it, it was one of the best hires that I ever made. And I took him to Chicago with me when I got the Bulls job. And then he was the head coach of the Windy City Bulls and did a phenomenal job there. Uh, so when he came back, you know, I really talked a lot about him and he and I got together and really tried to put a defensive scheme, uh, that, that would fit with the players that we have on this roster. We don't have a lot of great individual defenders. Mm -hmm. We've got good individual defenders, but this is really a team system and all five have to be in the right spot in order, uh, for this defense to work. And you're right, Steve, we do come from the baseline, which is pretty unique. Uh, as far as our double team scheme, we always have somebody, you know, it's uh, the opposite low man that is ready to come over and help any time that we are beat. We do not want to get beat to the middle of the floor. We don't have, uh, you know, something to cover when when you have that type of breakdown to the middle. But if it stays on the outer third and uh, on the uh, towards the baseline, uh, the sideline of the baseline, then we do have that built in help. Uh, so that's really what we try to do. And then, you know, just all we do a ton of drills every day uh, to really make sure that we're building the right habits so we can execute uh, for those 40 minutes. And even, you know, when I went back and looked at the Michigan game, I, I talked about this on my post game. I didn't think our defensive edge was great in the first half, mm -hmm. but a lot of that Michigan, it made a lot of tough shots. I mean, they made contested threes at the end of the shot clock. So it wasn't, which it generally it never is as good or as bad as you think it is. Mm -hmm. uh, but I did think our energy was pretty good. And then we kept that and I think even ramped it up a little bit in the second half where we held Michigan to 24 percent, one for 13 from the three point line. So, you know, those, these guys have been tied in and, uh, you know, I've been really pleased with how they cover for each other out there. And when you have a connected group on that end of the floor, again, you're going to have a chance most nights. Wrapping up here with Nebraska basketball head coach Fred Hoiberg. One more for you, coach. Um, you know, obviously we focus a lot on recruiting here at Husker Online and just want to kind of look back on, on your experience when you have postseason success and you're able to like play on the big stage in March, in March Madness. How much does that open doors when it comes to recruiting? And have you noticed maybe a, a change in how you've been received on the road during these off weeks and, and just – the on-court success carrying over to recruiting success and, and maybe giving you a little more momentum that way? Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt about it, Robin. It, it, it does help when you're on the national stage like this. And, you know, we're, listen, we're in a great league that's got as much exposure as any, uh, any conference in the country. So, you know, there is exposure. But when you have success, and we talk a lot about our system and our style, obviously, when we go into recruiting and, you know, we've had a lot of players that have made it. Uh, to the top level uh, at Iowa State, Nebraska, 12 players in nine years have made it to the NBA. And, you know, that that helps, that resonates. But when you have success and people can see uh, the style in the, in, the, in the system and, you know, there's a lot of freedom involved and it's very much NBA style basketball with the five out spread offense, uh, you know, then people really see what you're talking about. And, you know, listen, it's a, obviously a completely different dynamic right now with the portal, with NIL. Uh, but when you're playing on the national stage and your recruits can see that, uh, that obviously helps. So, you know, we, we met this morning, you know, as we do often about, uh, about recruiting and where things stand right now and just want to continue to get the right guys in this program. And we've really built this thing, I think, with a group uh, that Nebraskans and this fan base can be proud of because of how hard they play and how they leave everything they have on the floor. Generally, you know, it's very rare that we miss a loose ball and it happened again last night we you know we were the first to floor on numerous occasions and got way more 50 50 balls um you know than our opponent and that's been pretty uh held pretty true for this group and you know it's going to have to continue if we want to have success in march but you know this is a, a group that i think our fan base and i've heard a lot from the fans of uh you know a group they're, they're proud of and we want to continue on with that Fred, I'm I'm old and I've I'm old enough to yeah. stop. <laughs> I'm, I'm old enough to have seen you play in Ames. And you I'm, are old. <laughs> <laughs> did you, all right. Did you see uh did you, did you play defense as well as Sam? <laughs> he got his mother's feistiness. Let's just uh, let's just put it that way. Um, I, I I was actually pretty underrated. I, I I when you play at the level that you know I was very fortunate to play ten years in. You have to have some level of defensive uh, you know competitiveness, or you're going to get embarrassed. Especially when I played with the defensive 
you know, rules that were in place before they changed it now to the, uh, you know, the defensive three second. But um, yeah, I, and it kept when Mikhail was here last week, you know, we were talking a lot about that. And one thing that I had, I had good hands and I could always get the ball before when they were going up for their shot. Cause I wasn't getting it up top. And Sam's got way better feet than I ever had. His mm-hmm. anticipation, his feet uh, are as good as anybody, I think, in our league. I mean, he has really defended at a high level against some of the top players. Uh, you know, even looking back to when we played Michigan State and Tyson Walker, he was phenomenal there, helping out with Bryce Williams and Jamarcus Lawrence on Boo Booey uh, when we played them at our place. So he he's really uh, found a role in a niche on this team. And he always understands the scouting report as well. He's a very smart player on that end and uh you know the steals that he's come up with when i look at last year the maryland play at the end of the game getting the steal on the out of bounds play the, even the high low play that wisconsin ran where he came over the top and got a steal that's the play they run generally in the last possession and he knew that and he knew it was coming so he he's been terrific uh on that end and again you have to do something that will give you a role to put you on the floor and defense certainly has has been that for Sam. So yes, he, he is a better defender than I am, than I ever was simple, but um, you know, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't terrible. Right. Good answer, Fred. Good answer. All right. Well, that wraps it up here with Nebraska head coach, Fred Hoiberg coach. Thank man. you again for taking the time. Uh, I know you're a busy man and uh, now that now the fun part begins, right? Absolutely. Yep. I appreciate you guys. Thanks for having me. All, All right, right Fred, take good. care. Well, sip. Lot to chew on there from <laughs> Coach Hoiberg. Uh, lot to chew on. Yeah. I think I know where you're going with the. <laughs> yeah, and so like you know, a lot of that you know he's he's said before, but I thought he had some interesting notes in there as well. Where what jumped out to me, like just first thing off the top of my head, was him talking about that uh, this team and how they're built for right now for for march madness for mm-hmm. for the tournament setting and everything that comes along with that and you know they don't have a lot of guys that have played on this stage i think juan gary might be the only one that's been in the ncaa tournament or at least played minutes in the tournament but they're a veteran group that i think understands the situation and the work that is required for them to be successful and take advantage of this opportunity and you know i think that he he made a lot of good points about just the mental makeup of this group and i think you've really started to see what he was talking about with the way that they've handled their business down the stretch this season it's a mature older team Mm -hmm. like i don't worry about i mean the one thing i wouldn't worry about in in an ncaa tournament setting or the big 10 tournament setting is them getting flustered and losing because they just sort of lose their minds like a young player might do but there it's an older group of guys that's I mean, you see the poise, like you see rink mass poise, you see Bryce Williams poise, um, you see um, Josiah Alex poise. Kase is just hard to deal with. I mean, he's a hard he's guy. He's cooking to deal with. right now. He's cooking. He was. He was really. I mean, there's not that many players in America mm-hmm. that can make the shots that he made in Ann Arbor. There's just not. Yeah. He's a special. He's a very special shooter. I made a tweet during the Rutgers game when they had cut the lead down to six. Then all of a sudden he scores like a 12-2 run on his own, seven straight points. Yeah. And I said that there's not. I've never seen a player that can instantly change a game mm-hmm. more than Kase Tominaga. And that's not to say he's the best player I've ever seen or mm-hmm. the most dynamic player I've ever seen. But when it comes to coming out of nowhere and completely flipping the script within <clears throat> seconds. I've never seen any player do it like like the way Casey does. It. Well, how and, and now, that's what, what do you need in March? You need yeah, playmakers yeah. that step up when in the biggest moments. You can say a lot because you've covered this program since. Well, for us, Husker Online, two thousand eight, two thousand eight, eight <laughs> nine was my so first. That's a long time. But I was doing it with a DN before that too. So it's I was a there long, for the Collier days. Okay, that's a long time. I've been following Talk the pro- about being old. Yeah, <laughs> I've been. A, <laughs> I've been following the program literally since I was seven years old. Okay, 50 years. Um, they haven't, I don't know that they've had a shooter like this. Okay, he might be the best shooter to ever come through here. Jerry Fort was a great shooter. Brian Carr was a great shooter. I think Jack Jack Moore was a great shooter. They've had shooters. Um, but I don't, I mean, explosive weapons like Kase that you like you just said can can kind of take over a game. I don't know if they've had one like him. Mm-hmm. He took over the Michigan game early. He took it over. I mean, he he got him out of the gate, 
and it was sort of it's just a the array of shots he now makes is really impressive. It's not he's not just a three point shooter. He has got a mid range game and he goes to the rim. Oh yeah, you saw that in that yeah. Michigan game. He was attacking the rim. Attacks the rim, like turning down open looks from three to get to the rim. Right, like, that's I, a whole other element of his game. I kind of look at him like Curry in the NBA. I never would say Curry's the best player to ever play in the NBA, but he's the best shooter. I'd never say Casey's the best player to ever play for Nebraska. He's not, but he might be the best shooter. Um, so that's he's in the conversation. Yeah. He's so yeah, they got Fred put together a good team here. Isn't it interesting to Rob? Fred's known as an offensive, almost kind of like wizard, mm -hmm. but listen to him talk about defense. Oh, yeah. That's what's probably he, he, turned it for this he team. He learned the hard way. Those first three years, he thought that they could just go five out, play transition up and down, just outscore everybody 95 to 90 and, and be fine. Well, that doesn't work in the Big Ten. There are very few teams that can play that way. Michigan State plays that way, but guess what? They're also really physical, and they have big guys that, that can bang and um, you know have that Big Ten toughness to them. Iowa is the same way to where you know when they're at their best, they have that pace that um and an efficiency offensively that is as good as any in the country but when they've been good what have they had dominant big mm -hmm. you know aggressive forwards that mm -hmm. can clean up the glass guards tough tough nose guards uh that, at point guard so that's kind of what i think fred kind of learned that you know you're not just getting the the most elite scorers and trying to put them together mm -hmm. on a roster and say go out there and play you got to have an identity and going back to two off seasons ago uh, when he kind of had to restructure his contract there and it looked like things were getting a little dicey for him here at Nebraska after three straight really disappointing seasons, they made a cultural schematic shift, 180 degree flip from what they had been doing. And it was based on defense where you bring in guys like Nate Lenz or you bring in Adam Howard, you even Ernie Zieg Ziegler, uh, guys that know what they're doing when it comes to defense and they teach it every single day. And so that, that constant pounding of the defensive, um, you know, requirements that, that they've really been trying to instill. I think this is the evolution that you've seen where you saw them kind of embrace it last year, mm -hmm. but now, especially towards this back end of the season, they've really kind of made that who they are. And when Nebraska, this year's team is at its very best, they are playing elite defense. And when they play elite defense, they can beat almost anybody in the country. You see it. I'm a, I mean, a layman can see it. I mean, they double. You see them double the post. That's it's, they jump passing lanes. They're they, aggressive on the ball. They, they really rotate well. They don't go under screens. They right. they go over screens. Like that is, that's the mindset. Mm -hmm. That's the difference right now. Where the first three years under under Fred, it seemed like kind of defense was optional. I know that wasn't the case, but guys played that way. Mm -hmm. These guys aren't playing that way. And it goes back to last year. And you know, Fred will always go back to last season's team and those seniors with Sam Greasel, Emmanuel Bandamel. And Derek Walker. Oh, those are defenders. And really kind of being the first domino to fall mm -hmm. towards kind of embracing this new identity that Nebraska's really taken on. So they started it, but they had to continue it. And now you see Juwan Gary could be a defensive all Big Ten player. Yeah, you know? he's really I mean, good. Rink Mast is, is one of the better rebounders on the team. And Josiah Alec has really turned it on to where he's not just kind of the occasional hustle play 50 50 guy. Like, He's cleaning up the glass, especially the offensive glass. He's getting second chance opportunities. He's being a tough physical scorer mm -hmm. through contact at the rim. And so those three guys have really kind of spearheaded it inside. And then, you know, Fred talked about Sam leading the way there, but I'd put, um, you know, Jamarcus Lawrence's defense um, has been really good. His offense has been inconsistent, but defensively, he's always been really good. And then Bryce Williams' move to the point when you have a 6'7 guy, 6'7, 2'10, 215 whatever he is that's able to defend the ball coming mm -hmm. up the court on every possession. What a luxury it has been. I mean, yeah, he's he's, his move to point to become the primary point guard. I mean, there's a direct correlation with Nebraska really flipping the switch and Bryce Williams taking over as, as the lead guard. Yeah, he's, he's excellent. The other thing Fred pointed out was the importance of Lenzer. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, Len, I, it was interesting that Fred, Kind of, I guess singled him out. That's important. It's important for the fan base to understand. Mm -hmm. You do see Lenzer up exhorting that defense a lot. Mm -hmm. You can tell he's kind of leading that. So yeah, you got to tip your cap to that staff. You mentioned the other guys, Ziegler and Howard, but Lenzer evidently leading that. Well, if you go to a practice, and I've been to a handful of them, I don't get to go to a lot, but the ones that I've been to, it's Nate. 
Is Nate's it? at the center of the court, running every single drill, put making sure everybody's doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing. Fred gets involved here and there, but a lot of times he's just kind of overseeing and, mm -hmm. and offering thoughts and, you know, kind of helping transition from drill to drill. But when it comes to the actual on court work on a day to day basis, Nate is front and center with everything that they do. And that's why Fred mentioned him first as one of the biggest reasons why they've been able to become such a good defensive team. A lot of it has to do with Nate Lenzer. Lenzer should be and very Adam proud. Howard is, is certainly in there. His impact is really felt with just the, the schematics that he's brought, like the, the, the defensive, um, you know, ways that they, they, they play now, the different zones that they run, mixing in presses and, and all the different looks that they've started to kind of embrace over the last two years. A lot of that has been, from adam howard's background and it was a big reason why fred sought him out because he uh, saw adam at a, a coaching convention or something where adam gave a presentation mm -hmm. about um you know it was just kind of his defensive principles mm -hmm. and fred was like whoa and so then he went down he was visiting his son uh down at tcu fred was and ended up checking out a game when adam howard's at south alabama i can't remember who they were playing maybe it was ut arlington mm -hmm. and yeah his, his oldest son was playing anyway he watched them and just really liked what South Alabama was doing defensively. Interesting. And so that kind of led the way to where, you know, Fred knew he needed to embrace defense. So he went and got Nate and he went and got Adam. And then Ernie's been kind of the and then, on top. And then meanwhile, you you hear from coaches all the time that Fred's offensive acumen's through the roof. Good. And you and again, as a layman, if you pay if you're paying attention, you see the way he gets his shooters open shots. Like right. the way he gets K Say open. K Say works hard to get open, but there's a you can see what's going on a lot of the time. Picks being set perfectly. Fred knows how to get shooters open. Also, what I've said all along about this team, what what I immediately thought it goes with defense. I mean, you have the defense, but at the end of the day, this is a, a team with multiple good shooters, not just Casey. They put shooters around Casey, which makes Casey even more dangerous. Yeah, I mean, they can have five shooters on the floor at once. Yeah. And so going back to the kind of offense part of it the the center position has been just as critical where they have had now two centers that can do things that a lot of bigs cannot do yeah. with the basketball yeah Derek Walker was one of the best passing big men I've ever seen could and go left or right too which he led the right team right. in assists yeah. and like he, he could do he could beat guys off the dribble yeah off left the or the right the key yeah so I mean he kind of started that but then rink mass has added Same. a completely different element to even when he's not scoring mm -hmm. his facilitating mm -hmm. out of the high post yeah. and his ability to distribute and uh, and let all those four other guards or whoever's around him kind of move as they want off the ball and he finds them that is when this offense is really humming because then it's not just standing around waiting for a shot. You got movement and you got a guy that's your biggest player on the floor distributing from the top of the key. So that from the offensive standpoint, you want to talk about the evolution. I think having that type of five man has been critical for allowing this offense to really come, come full circle. And he's very, he's very mature, mm -hmm. but the, he's, this is a mature team and he's kind of, he's kind of, I think rank is kind of emblematic of that. We're going to do our first ad from our great sponsor, Omaha Steaks. Simple, I know you love steaks. I love uh, steaks. Yeah, yeah. What better time than to take advantage of Omaha Steaks' semi-annual sale? Get 50% off site-wide and save on mouth-watering favorites today. Go to omahasteaks.com slash husker and shop the semi-annual sale where you can load up on all the delicious flavor you crave at half the price. From their tender, juicy, butcher's cut filet mignons, mouth-watering pure ground burgers, comfort classics, and easy-to-prepare meals that are perfect for those busy weekend nights. Plus, as an added bonus, you'll get eight free Omaha Steaks burgers on select packages when you shop at omahasteaks.com slash husker. With Omaha Steaks, the possibilities are endless. Endless flavor and endless value on incredible entrees, scrumptious sides, decadent desserts, and more. All of them are 50% off during the semi-annual sale, and every bite is backed by their 100% unconditional guarantee. Visit omahasteaks.com slash husker and get eight free Omaha Steaks burgers with select packages when you shop the semi-annual sale. Hurry, because this deal won't last long. That's omahasteaks.com slash husker. Good job, okay. Rob. Thank you. We're yes. going to move on to our next headline here, mm -hmm. which is the Big Ten Tournament and mm -hmm. Nebraska's draw in that. And I know there were a lot of people on Husker Online, Red Sea Scrolls message board, and social media that could not have been happier 
about Nebraska's draw as the three seed. Go back to that Michigan game. Why was it so important? Well, they got the three seed, and you saw why. I mean, yeah. they're the latest game of the day on Friday, so they get the maximum amount of rest, mm -hmm. and they also get to play teams that, of the three potential teams uh -huh. they can face, which, as you see here on the graphic, there you uh, go. The Indiana will play the winner of Michigan, Penn State. Okay. Nebraska's 5-0 and this season against those three teams <laughs> Hello. combined. Hello. That's a good deal. Including two true road wins. So you're in pretty good shape, what, what you'd say, in the quarterfinals. The semis, the semis you're going to play Ohio State, Iowa, or Illinois. Now that, then, it, then it's a little more. It's, it gets a little more difficult no as doubt. it should. As it should. Yeah, Those are, are all Illinois to win the whole tournament. I'm sorry. People are picking Illinois to win the whole tournament. Are they really over Purdue? So They're, yeah, I mean, but that you're in the semifinals of the conference tournament. You're going to play somebody good more often than not. Ohio State's maybe one of the hottest teams in the conference, right? Right. Now. Iowa whipped Nebraska by 18 points right. this year. They'll have so to, yeah. I mean, it's it's not going to be an easy draw. But as far as the opportunity to win a game, oh yeah, have the resume, potentially vault your seating in the NCAA tournament, and get to play in the semifinals of the Big Ten tournament, which the Nebraska has never done. <laughs> uh, on a Saturday yes, afternoon, never played on, on the Saturday on CBS, of, of the Big Ten tournament on CBS. You heard Fred Hoiberg talk about just the value of being on that national stage. That's the national stage right there. So opportunity abound. And I'm with most people. I, you could not ask for a better draw. Indiana's kind of turned it on late, but Nebraska handled them both games. That's better. a great matchup for them. Yeah. Michigan is the worst team in the conference. So the odds are they're going to play Penn, <laughs> the winner of Penn State, right. Indiana. And Penn State, I don't know. Nebraska Penn, really handled them here. Yeah, like they, Here's they the deal with Penn me. State, Rob. Here's the deal. They're really challenged offensively. In Nebraska, I thought, I, I mean, I don't want to say exposed it. I, maybe it's just a good matchup for Nebraska. But Penn State really had trouble offensively against Nebraska and PBA. Mm -hmm. So you're right. I mean, it's, it's a very – it's a very kind bracket for Nebraska. Yeah, and so that game will tip off, as you see, around around 8 o'clock on Friday night on okay. Big Ten Network. Um, it's going to be 25 minutes after the conclusion of Illinois' game, uh, whoever they play. So okay. roughly 8 o'clock. And, um, you know, like I said, that it kind of creates an interesting circumstance to where, like, I think Nebraska is going to leave on – I think they're going to leave Thursday, I believe. I can't confirm that I think now. you would, though, right? I think they're going to leave You wouldn't Thursday, leave Wednesday, you know, right? And then they're going to get there. So that basically gives them all day Friday to just kind of sit around for a little bit, which, right. you know, you hear football teams when they go in those play night games. Like, that's kind of the hardest part is just sitting around the hotel. So they got to find a way to stay engaged, stay fresh. But just being able to play a team like Indiana that's or that's or Penn State, that they're either going to be playing their second game in 48 hours or third game in 72 hours that's such a luxury and nebraska with the way that their schedule kind of shaked out i know that the staff wasn't necessarily thrilled to have both of their um bye weeks basically at the tail end of the season mm -hmm. including uh just recently before michigan but now you get an off week before michigan you play michigan then you basically get another off week going into the big 10 tournament so Rest and recovery, I think, is going to be critical because they are beat up right now, especially in their front court. Rink Mast, his knees. I mean, I see pictures of him like signing autographs and stuff. He's got two big old ice packs on both of his knees. Like he's just kind of he's grinding right now. Mm -hmm. Josiah Alec is grinding right now. After the Rutgers game, uh, he was walking around at some of the state tournament games with a big old boot on his ankle. To totally uh um preventative. Preventative, thank you. Uh, but you know, I think that shows you that he's got he came here with bad ankles and so he's feeling that grind a little bit so while in january early february you would have loved to have a bye week as that grind was kind of really hitting now they get the benefit of having much needed rest recovery time off to get their bodies right going into tournament play because as you know starting friday night you're not going to get a whole lot of breaks no um as far as the rest of the bracket go are there you know you just surveying the bracket it's interesting rob there's that narrative that the league is down i get it you know there we were probably looking at six teams in the ncaa tournament compared to the big 12 probably getting nine but i i don't and i don't know though it doesn't when i i'm careful with that down conversation Rutgers and maryland are playing on the first day 
13 versus 12. Those teams aren't that bad. I mean, neither of them. They both have wins against Nebraska. Mm -hmm. Their teams are that aren't that bad. I'm, it's tempting to say, for instance, that Purdue has a cakewalk to Sunday. Ah, uh, that's my initial reaction. But the, then when you think about it, I don't know. I don't know if they have a cakewalk. I, these teams aren't bad. Even even facing Minnesota or Michigan State, those teams are capable of upsetting Purdue. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't want to say anybody has a cakewalk. And, I, and I'm hesitant to say the league is really down. I think it's a, it's a little down. But man, I watch these teams, and I, I, I'm still struck by their their physicalness and their athleticism and size. Mm -hmm. Now, what's going to be interesting to me is when, once Nebraska closes out the Big Ten tournament and gets into March Madness, what the officiating is going to look like. <laughs> you and your officiating. No, I'm serious. What do you wonder about? Why, why do you think the Big Ten struggles in the, in March Madness? Why? Because they play a completely different game because the officials in the tournament call games completely differently than they do What's during the, the majority of their season. The level of physicality they're allowed to get away with. Casey in the Big Ten? I'm curious to see how many fouls Casey Tomonaga draws in that first game because he doesn't get any Quite right now. Quite they hold him, they grab him, they yeah. tug him, they bump him, they do yeah. anything they want yeah. with zero repercussion. Yeah. And so what happens when they actually get a, a different conference crew that, that calls those things? Right. Oh, that's a good point. Casey could have. 12 free throws in yeah. that first Seriously. game. I'm serious. Yeah. So, like, uh, that's going to be a different element, too. Interesting. Um, once they get there. And so we'll talk more about the NCAA tournament here a little bit later. Um, but then, I guess, our next headline here, uh, it's award season. Yes, yeah, awards. Big Ten uh, postseason awards that, um, you know, there's a lot of discussion about. I mean, I don't know if the top – flight like the first team all big 10 is really that much of a debate but i think when you get into the second and third teams okay that's when it gets a little interesting you have a ballot rob i do i do you have, have a, ballot. a ballot i do have a ballot and so um i just wanted for full disclosure here full mm -hmm. transparency mm -hmm. my first team all big 10 ballot goes as so basically i'll explain the format they send you a list or like a little portal that you go in there and you're supposed to just click the first five players for your, your top group. Okay. And then, so like, then the next five and then the next five, and then it's like points awarded that they tally up through all the votes. Okay. And so therefore your first guys obviously get more points. So my first five, my first team ballot, Zach Eady, Braden Smith from Purdue. Okay. Terrence Shannon, Jr. Marcus Domask from Illinois. And then Boo Booey from Northwestern. Good. That's a, that's a, uh, what would, what would the debate be? Who, There's who you not. leave out? There's, There's not. not. I mean, with Doesn't that, seem with that like first it. group. And so that's why that next, when you get to the second team, that's where the debate comes into it. And I did not have a Nebraska player on the second team. Hmm. My second team was Coleman Hawkins okay. from Illinois, Elijah Hawkins from Minnesota, who almost led the nation in assists this year. Ace Baldwin from Penn State, who I think is the best on-ball defender in the conference. Cliff uh, Omariuri Rutgers. from Rutgers one of the best shot blockers in all of college basketball. And then Jameer Young from Maryland. Third team. There's where you get your first Husker. I had Kasei Tomonaga, and I had, um, let's see, who else? And then I had uh, Khalil Ware from Indiana. And then Julian Reese, Maryland. Brooks Barnheiser from Northwestern. And Tyson Walker from Michigan State. I, I wonder if I Discuss. Could, yeah, I if I were going to. Who am I leaving out? Nobody. I would. I would. I'd almost. I think I could make a case for Casey and the second team over Omar, Om, the Rutgers center, who's Cliff, a, big Cliff. Yeah, who has trouble scoring. Um, had a good. I mean, he's a he's a force. I just but think he he's one of the best bigs in the conference. He's one of the best bigs for sure. He didn't. Have, he didn't look like much against Nebraska in Lincoln. Mm -hmm. Didn't have a rebound until the second half. But I know. I know his. He's powerful. He's a powerful player. That would be one I. I mean, if I was going to just challenge it a little bit, I might. I'm just looking for ways to get Casey in the second team. That's what about probably Rink. Yeah. Andy Katz had Rink Mass in his second team all Big Ten. Did he really? Yes. So that made me think, like, wow, am I just totally no. hating on the Husker or what? No, you're careful. And I appreciate that. Rink, I could get him on a third team. It's tough, though. Mm -hmm. It's interesting to me that the first team is that cut and dried, especially Braden Smith. Now he's come a long way. Yeah, I mean, over he's, he's like a Bob Cousy Award finalist. Is he? Yes, he's one of the best point guards in the country. 
hmm, that's a that's a great combo they have with Edie and him. Yes. A, because he wasn't – now, he made a big jump from his freshman to he sophomore did. year. He was good, but now he's he's really good. Yeah. I'd say he's made a big jump for the first part of the schedule even. I I saw – I mean, I, I thought he was all right, but now he must be playing really well. Yeah. Um, that's critical. That's critical. But, no, I I think your teams are – I think they're excellent, Rob. Yeah, so You know this stuff. You watch it as closely as anybody. I mean, you do. You see all the teams and – yeah, a lot of it was just based off personal, like in-person observation. Well, I may have only had one Nebraska player on my All Big Ten teams, but I'll tell you who did get a vote from me is Fred Hoiberg mm -hmm. for Coach of the Year. Mm -hmm. I think that you can make a case for Matt Painter and the job that he did at Purdue, where they were the gold standard in the conference from start to finish, and you know really built that program into a legitimate national title contender. But Nebraska was picked twelfth. Yeah, in the preseason projections, mm -hmm. nobody expected them to do anything this year. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of that had to do with just unfamiliarity with the roster. Like, yeah, they brought back a good core, but nobody knew what Rink Mass was going to do or Josiah Alec or Bryce Williams or, you know, any of these guys that you know were going to be key members of that rotation. So I think just the unknown, I think, kind of tempered expectations for this group. But with the work that they've done, I mean, even the first part of the season, you know, they, they did what they were supposed to do, mm -hmm. but I think what has really separated is how they finished mm -hmm. and the work mm -hmm. that they've done in the big 10. And you, you made the point sip about the narrative that the big Ten's down this year. Like, no, it's not, it's not down. It's the big 10. It's still one of the top three conferences yeah. in all of college basketball. I'd be careful with that narrative. Yeah. And so Nebraska has established itself in one of the best teams in one of the best conferences. Mm -hmm. And, just to do that in this grind uh, is nothing short of impressive. Oh, me. yeah. I mean, the, the the fact that they not only have surpassed expectations and put themselves in the tournament conversation, but they've become one of the one of the programs of the Big Ten this year, which I don't think anyone could have ever expected going into the season. No, it's they've won seven of their last eight. I mean, okay, it's, so I'd start with that. Then I'd go clear back, though, when, you know, to our interview with Fred. Fred talking about April and June, April through June, how they put the team together. It's not by accident that they, that they have these type of players. Fred, Fred told us a little bit ago that they're trying to do it again where they get the right type of guys. Mm -hmm. Robin, they got the right type yeah. of guys. They built a culture. Right, build a culture, but you only you can only do that really if you have the right type of guys. Rink is the right type of guy. Alec is the right type of guy. Gary's the right type of guy. Mm -hmm. Just on, on and on. I, I mean, Sam is a big part of that. Bryce Williams is a big part of it. I mean, you can just go. I can name every player. They just got tough-minded guys. Mm -hmm. Not perfect. I mean, these guys don't play perfect basketball all the time. Nobody does. But man, you can especially in the second half of the season, you knew what you were going to get, you know, game to game. And that's saying a lot about a team. You knew Nebraska, you knew what you were going to cover mm -hmm. um, with a couple minor exceptions, but you know, at Northwestern, they didn't play that well down the stretch, but what else? I mean, the, otherwise you turn on the TV or you go to the game, you knew what you were getting. Yeah. And like, that's not a Nebraska specific issue either. Like mm -hmm. this entire college basketball season has been defined by, inconsistency mm -hmm. even purdue look how many games they've lost i mean it hasn't been many but like they've lost games that they shouldn't have lost so nebraska. it happens especially when you go on the road so mm -hmm. um nebraska did what it needed to do at home but i think with the way they finally changed the the script with their road success oh, huge you know, say what you want they beat indiana indiana turned it on right indiana. after that game you win an assembly hall come on i mean yeah. that's that's a that's a that's an achievement. And they took care of business in a Michigan game that, yes, they were five and a half, six and a half point favorites in that one, but that's a, that was a weird game. Weird game. That's Senior what I said day Fred, for, yeah. for Michigan. Yeah. 10 a.m. body clock tip. Quiet. For that game. But yeah, the half empty arena. Like that, It's a challenge. It is a challenge. And I think that kind of shows just how far mentally this group has come, and that's coaching. Mm. It's coaching. Also, it is coaching, but also Kese. If you watch that game, I don't know if he was making a – like a conscious effort to show energy or if he just got hot and as a result, yeah, showed they're, energy. they're usually one and the same when, yeah. when he starts feeling it, then all of a sudden that energy just takes. Holy over. God, he was energetic in that game. 
was impressive. Yeah, it was. He it was. I mean, he got him out of the gate. It was in, like I said earlier. I just don't think there's too many players in the country that can do what he did in that game in the first half. Score 23 well, points. And like Fred said, Michigan was lights out. Like they could not miss either. Mm -hmm. Doug McDaniel hit five of his first six threes. Like yeah. they were at 43 cooking. at halftime. They were cooking too. Yeah, but, Michigan had 43. But Nebraska never panicked. And a lot of that was because every time Michigan came down to make a big shot, case they followed with another one. Yeah. And they were just able to go blow for blow. Michigan eventually lost steam. Game over. Mm -hmm. Michigan always loses steam in the second half. Yeah, they're bad second they're, half team. Bad second tough half group team. right now. Yeah, <laughs> not in a good way. Yeah. Uh, finishing out the ballots, uh, all freshman team. I had Owen Freeman for Iowa. Okay, Mackenzie Mbako from Indiana. Okay, Cam Christie from Minnesota. Yeah, Gavin Griffiths from Rutgers. Yeah, John Blackwell from Wisconsin. And my freshman of the year is Owen Freeman for Iowa. Well, oh, he was good against Nebraska. I don't know. And again, that's a lot of it is like when I, I watch guys in person, I see what they did, and the, the one constant sample was Nebraska. I mean, he he took that game over. Freeman has great footwork around the rim. Um, he's a good shooter for a big. He's got great touch around the rim. And he yeah. runs the floor really well. There apparently was a split between Freeman and Baco and Christie, like within the Christie's Big Ten voting. Tough. So on Monday, they had us resubmit our freshman of the year voting just to like basically try to recalculate it so really tight race i went with freeman but you could easily talk me into either of the other. christy days. is interesting to me because he's a great shooter from the perimeter but against nebraska he was really aggressive going to the rim mm -hmm. um, i like him he's a great shooter but he was i thought i was really struck by his aggression in lincoln he didn't shoot the ball well. i think he was three for 12 mm -hmm. that game didn't shoot it well but got to the rim a lot and ended up making some free throws that got his point total up there. Got another Husker that I voted for as well, moving to the all-defensive team. Juwan Gary oh God. is on my all-Big Ten defensive team and really needs no explanation. He can guard one through five. Uh, he's their, one of their best rebounders, one of their most tenacious on-ball defenders. Uh, he just brings that, like he likes to say, junkyard dog mentality. I mean, you talk about just why this team has been so good defensively. Juwan Gary is kind of where it starts, yep. in my opinion. They said, yeah, they said on the broadcast that he's like Khalil Mack to this defense, yeah. Yeah. the Chicago Bears. I think that was Nate. He's a yeah. big Bears fan. Yeah, <laughs> Nate Lenzer. Is Mack still with the Bears? I don't know. If, you know uh, I don't think so. I don't know where the hell he's at. But, um, but that's who he compared. Jawan Gary too. That he Jawan Gary means to Nebraska's defense what Khalil Mack mean meant to the Bears. Defense. Yeah, they're a good defense without him. With him, they're a totally different unit. And just think back to that Rutgers game out in Piscataway, where mm -hmm. he just is running up the court, pulls up on his ankle, and you're like, oh no, oh, blowing man. Achilles. <laughs> his season's over. Nebraska's season's over. What? How are they going to recover? Comes back in another like two weeks. Was it two weeks? Roughly. They, they had some time, I think, between games. But either way, the injury, thankfully, was not nearly as bad as it could have been, and that changed the entire complexion to where Nebraska was able to maintain being that elite of a defensive team, and it's really carried them down the stretch. So, uh, Juwan Gary, you know, I jokingly said that Sam Hoiberg should have a conversation of that as well, where, I mean, he'll, he'll never get a vote, but you want to talk about guys that come in and make immediate impacts? <sighs> Sam Hoyer, like what, what walk on comes off the bench in the middle of a game and says, All right, you're going to go guard the other team's best player. In the I think second you shut him down. Down the stretch. Yeah. And come up with big plays. Not just shut him down, get game changing steals, transition layups, mm -hmm. dive for loose balls to, to oh, yeah. change possessions. Like that's what Sam Hoyberg brings. So he didn't get a vote from me, but he has, he has a vote in my heart. Uh, the rest of the all defensive team Ace Baldwin, who I said is the best on ball defender in the Big Ten, Zach Eady, obvious, uh, Omori. Uh, obvious, and then Terrence Shannon as well. So, player of the year, Zach Eady, no brainer. Um, six man of the year, I voted CJ Wilcher, even though he kind of tailed off a little bit. I think the Gillis kid from Purdue is going to end up getting it. But when Nebraska, especially like in February, when they were really starting to click and you started to see them go from a, a competitive team to a really good team. C.J. Wilcher was bringing it every single night, getting 15 to 20 a game and being probably a more prolific, consistent three-point shooter than Casey was mm -hmm. at that time. Oh, Wilcher can really shoot it. So, he, again, he's kind of gone through a little bit of a funk lately. A little bit. But he is a huge reason why Nebraska is where they are today because of his production off the bench. He was an instant game changer mm -hmm. when he came off the bench. So I don't think he'll win it. 
but he's got my vote. All right. Well, before we move on to our final headline of the show, I want to introduce another sponsor, Mando. My guys. Sip. Are they your guys, Rob? <laughs> <laughs> They're my guys. Okay. Hey, Sip, I know you can relate to this. You ever lift a little too hard or just forget to apply your daily deodorant and just get hit by a truckload of BO from all directions? I usually don't smell, but yeah. Does that three-in-one shampoo leave you needing a second shower just a few hours after the first? <laughs> well, from the <laughs> founders of Lumi, Mando Whole Body Deodorant is helping men conquer their there odor in a new way. Formulated by Mandelic Acid, Mando has long-lasting 72-hour control that actually stops odor before it starts. Best part is you can put Mando everywhere. Think about that, Sid. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> to top it off, Mando's cologne quality scents were created with men in mind. Pro tip, try their best-selling scent, Bourbon Leather. Ooh, that's a game changer. That is a game changer. Once you experience fresher underarms and fresher feet you'll never go back with this special offer new customers can get five dollars off a starter pack with our exclusive code and link use code husker at shopmando.com that's shopmando.com and take advantage of this exclusive offer for husker online listeners mando mando, mando. yep that's the stuff all right so we'll close it out here um we've talked a lot of nebraska and we'll We've got the Big Ten tournament. We're not going to count our chickens before they hatch here. But mm -hmm. looking ahead past mm -hmm. the Big Ten tournament, it is a almost certainty that Nebraska has clinched a berth to the NCAA tournament. Just looking at the latest bracketology outlook following Sunday's win at Michigan, Nebraska was in 108 of 108 projected brackets, according to Bracket Matrix. Seems pretty safe. TeamRankings.com gives, gives Nebraska a 99% chance of making the tournament T rankatology gives Nebraska a 99.7 per chance percent chance of making the field and an 88.7 percent chart chance at a at large bid so it's basically a formality at mm -hmm. this point it's, I don't think it's the conversation is whether in it's a matter of how high of a seed they could potentially get and right now going mm -hmm. into Minneapolis Nebraska is generally anywhere from a nine to a ten by most of the major bracketologists you know joe lenardi and espn has him as a nine playing in memphis jerry palm cbs has him as a 10 playing florida and memphis uh, andy katz i think his most recent bracket had them as a nine seed playing texas in salt lake city and then mike decorsi of fox sports has him as a 10 playing saint mary's in omaha nebraska mm -hmm. could happen could easily happen and mm -hmm. there was a lot of conversation too about whether the selection committee would try to avoid those mm -hmm. types of placings, but really that only applies to the the top seeds. Like they don't want Kansas playing in Kansas City or right. you know those ty those types of things. But when it comes to your eight, nine, 10, 11 seeds, they actually prefer it because they know it's going to sell more tickets. So mm -hmm. there's a very, very good, good chance, chance yeah. that Nebraska could be placed in Omaha. And I've seen some brackets where um, I want to say it was maybe DeCourcy's bracket where the next the second round potential matchup with Iowa State in Omaha the Fred Hoiberg reunion game against his alma mater it'd be the hard, it'd be Omaha. one of the hardest tickets to get anywhere can you imagine yeah Iowa State fans coming over to Brad oh yeah I mean, come on and it'd be hot in there it'd be Oof. that would be loud and hot so there's a lot of you know momentum for Nebraska too like people want them to go to Omaha I mean I I get it like that would be essentially like playing in Sioux Falls <laughs> with the amount of fan support they're going to have there. So that's definitely something to watch, not just what seed Nebraska gets, but what, what the location could be. Rob, <clears throat> this is, this is, we just got to really enjoy this. Nebraska fans have to you know it's been I 10 mean, years since we've had these conversations in now legitimately you have reason to look at the field look at who's hot right now who's not who's trying to get in the who's trying to get in the tournament who could fall out mm -hmm. you have a reason to look at it now it's really this is fun i and you know i don't want to get ahead of ourselves too much but a lot of these guys from nebraska are back this is something we might be able to get used to yeah. i haven't i mean i just started lo looking at the national scene really today and where Nebraska might fit. And the one thing you'd say about the national picture is it's there's no dominant team, number one. No, nope. there's not. That was the case this year. Yeah. Purdue's your potential number one overall seed. Nebraska 
whipped them. Right now, today, <laughs> Purdue would be the number one overall. Yeah. UConn would be two. Mm -hmm. uh, three would be Houston. And then four, Tennessee probably. And you might – somebody else might be able to – who, who else would it be? Tennessee or – Tennessee's not for sure. The first yeah, – Right now, they're in that conversation. Then you're looking at – Arizona, yes, Arizona, Marquette, okay, um, North I, Carolina, yeah. Iowa State. There you go. There you go. The first three you can, or you can bank on Houston being a one, Purdue being a one, UConn, and UConn being a one. But I wouldn't say any of those teams are dominant. UConn, I watched Creighton dismantle mm -hmm. UConn in Omaha. Mm -hmm. We we watched Nebraska dismantle, pretty much dis, dismantle Purdue and Lincoln. Um. Houston, I haven't seen. I mean, I just uh, now, but I will tell you, I'll tell you what Houston did in their first year in the Big 12. They won it. Okay. They won the Big 12 in their first year. And Kansas, meanwhile, wasn't Kansas has had kind of a down year for their standards for sure. Yeah. So there you go. There could be your number one seeds right there. And then from there, there's a lot of interesting, there's a lot of interesting things going on out there. So to, Joe Lenardi's latest bracket. He's the one that has Nebraska as a nine seed playing St. Mary's in the eight nine game in Memphis. Guess who the the one seed in that bracket is? That Nebraska would play in UConn. the round. Houston. Oh, Houston. I'm sorry. Yeah, Houston. Yeah, yeah. So tough draw there. Real That's tough. That's kind of like that, that brings up the discussion of would Nebraska rather be a ten? A seed? ten. Yeah. Because then you avoid that second round matchup likely against the number one overall seeds. I mean something to be said for that but then you know you gotta wonder too like if they're the 10 what's the likelihood of them getting placed in omaha so there's a lot of variables involved there i just say get as high of a seed and just play the play the hand you're dealt well and like fred said i, I mean i read your story from the michigan game that there's not a lot there's not pressure on nebraska right now they're per, they're pretty much in they're going to minneapolis stress free weekends yeah it's pretty said. stress free i think they can lose I mean, not that they want to lose or any. I don't think they will lose in the first in that first game in Minneapolis. But if they do, it's not it's not something that would jeopardize their chances. No, no, they're they're in a good situation. They've earned it. And and I'm and I and I think closing against Michigan was big. It was uh, closing with that win got them to three seed, and it did take some pressure off. It did. So because that if you lose that Michigan game, then all of a sudden that door remains cracked open cracked. of. Well, what if they go into Selection Sunday having lost three of their last four games, including right. at Michigan, right. the worst Michigan team in decades? Right. You know, and so that conversation now is closed. I, I agree with you. I don't think anything that happens in Minneapolis is going to dictate no. Nebraska's NCAA tournament no, they're good. fate. All it can do is improve their seating right. at this point. So um, it's fun. It's yeah, Rob, I, you've earned this. And we're we're going to go out. So Sipple yeah. and I are going to head up to Minneapolis to cover the Big Ten tournaments. Mm -hmm. We'll be up there for as long as Nebraska's up there. And then mm -hmm. after that, uh, once Selection Sunday is here, we know our brackets will be on the road. Could be Brooklyn, could be Memphis, Memphis could be Omaha. Could Salt be, Lake City. Yeah, God, Spokane. I Spokane. Mean, well, it's pretty wide range of places we could go. It I'm is. saying I'm pushing for Memphis. Yeah, you're big on Memphis. Yeah, it's the barbecue in Beale Street. Um, I've never been to Memphis. Oh, ho, 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 ho. I've never walked. Well, I will show you around. <laughs> 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 All right. Well, that'll do it for this special edition of our Nebraska basketball Husker headlines. Robin Washit, Stephen Sipple, thanks for joining us, and more fun to come with Husker hoops down the road.